Hi everyone, uh, hopefully you can hear us again now. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's terrific to have you all here for our Fundraising Fundamentals webinar this afternoon. Mm -hmm. My name's Cheryl Nixon. I'm the Director of Donor Relations with Schools Plus and my role is to uh, really lead the fundraising efforts at Schools Plus for um, the fundraising that we do on behalf of schools. And I'm Melissa, I am the School Community Fundraising Officer at Schools Plus and um, I have a background in community fundraising um, and yeah, really loving this role so far, working with school. That's right, Melissa's pretty new with us and um, today is her first webinar, so uh, it's fantastic to have you here with yes. us, thanks so much. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> uh, so the purpose of the webinar today is to really share some ways in which Schools Plus are able to help you to fundraise for your fantastic school community. Um, we're really hoping that today you'll gain some tips uh, from us about how to move your fundraising perhaps a bit beyond uh, what you've done traditionally. I know many schools have been able to do um, fundraising through cake stalls or sausage sizzles or things kind of within your school community and um, we are hoping that we can help you to move kind of beyond the school gate and, and into some wider networks. Um, we're going to cover four different things today. We're going to talk a little bit about Schools Plus. Um, we know that some of you have been connected with us in the past but uh, some of you are new to us so welcome. Um, we'll also talk about project planning that really important first step uh, then where you might go to find some funds and finally have a bit of a dive into the fundraising platform that we've created especially for schools and PNCs. Mm -hmm. Uh, so just before we kick off, a uh, few logistics to cover. So we'll be using a mixture of the presentation um, that's on screen at the moment and screen sharing. Uh, so if there is any issues, um, give us a shout out with the chat function. Um, my first time driving a webinar, so let me know um, and we can help fix that for you. Uh, you can also use the chat function to ask questions. Um, so if you haven't found it yet, if you're on a computer, there'll be a speech bubble you can click on and then on a phone, um, tap your screen and it should come up with some options options. Um, so if you wanted to give that a try now, um, just shout out the school that you're, um, you're from or supporting. Um, and if you might have any projects in mind um, already for some fundraising, um, for example, uh, recently we've been working on some schools um, uh, with a sensory garden project, um, lots of schools with STEM projects, um, and also uh, we've been helping a school get some students to a maths and science camp. Um, so there's a whole wide range of projects that we're supporting. So we'd love to hear about that now um, and the school that you're from. Yeah, that would be fantastic because we've found that with these webinars, um, they can be really effective if we're able to talk directly to the sorts of projects that you're fundraising for and answer any questions that you have. So we'd love for you to be chatting with us as the, um, as the webinar goes on. So um, first of all, and thank you, I can see some things popping up there already, that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, let me do a quick overview of Schools Plus. At Schools Plus, we really um, are passionate about making sure that every student is able to fulfill their potential, and that is regardless of their circumstance or their family background. And we do that by helping schools, and particularly schools in less advantaged communities, connect with donors who also know the value of a, a great education. We were established just a few years ago. We really started fundraising back in 2015 and we were established as a result of the initial Gonski review. And uh, of course you'll remember that review, but in its um, final chapter, it talked about how there were a number of barriers that prevented schools from connecting with donors. So we were really set up to help those schools um, connect with donors. 
Um, so among the things that we do, we enable schools to receive tax deductible donations and, and for some donors that tax deductibility is a real draw card. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we do a lot of, we do all the work for you in that case. We um, provide the uh, receipts, the tax deductible receipts to the donors and try and cut down on the admin for your school. Um, we also, as we've talked about, have our Fundraise Yourself platform, which enables schools to publish uh, a project and then promote it to their wider communities. And we'll talk about that in a lot more detail as we go on today. Mm -hmm. We've developed over the years a number of resources that we make available to you through our website so that you can grow your own philanthropy. You can go out there and make your own connections with your communities and um, find new ways to fundraise for your students. And um, we also do things like this webinar where we're able to share um, success stories and um, help you gain insights from others into the, um, into the successes or, you know, what you've learned from uh, the, the fundraising that you've done. What sort of things have we got going on there, uh, So we've got um, uh, somebody's trying to raise funds for an SEP playground, mm -hmm. um, for some literary resources, school furniture. Um, a garden project um, and some STEM, STEM and robotics. So STEM is um, quite a, a common theme that we find the schools are looking to raise funds for at the moment. Absolutely, and fantastic to see a real mix of um, principals, teachers and parents here as well. Um, I talked a bit about how we work with schools, particularly in less advantaged communities, and uh, the, the definition of disadvantage for us is the ICSIA value of a school. So ICSIA is a bit of a mouthful. It stands for the Index of Community Socio-Educational Advantage. And for us, schools that we're able to support are those that have an ICSIA value below 1,000. Um, so uh, um, check your eligibility. I think those of you who've joined us today are eligible, but that is, that is the eligibility criteria that we look at. And you can find that out by looking at the My School website. Um, and finally, we will go into more detail about our Fundraise Yourself platform later on in the, in the webinar here today, but it is a way um, in which you're able to fundraise from your community. Like any crowdfunding website, you um, uh, promote or you publish your project on that platform. You get a unique web link that you're able to share with your uh, community, your networks. Um, you can include, include photos, videos and, and updates on there to let your community know how you're going and um, provide that kind of draw card for them with the photos of, of your students. It's free to access for schools and PNCs and there is a toolkit in there of tips and resources to help you with your fundraising. At the end of this webinar, you'll get a bit of a sneak preview of how that looks for you as well. Definitely. Okay. okay. Um, so moving into the first part um, of the of your project creation would be your um, the planning of your project. So um, planning for any project is really important, in particular for fundraising. Um, and the best plans we've found they start on paper. Uh, so. Um, what we suggest is you write a few notes down of your ideas, what you're looking to fund um, and how you're going to achieve that. Um, so it doesn't have to be a big plan. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a massive document. It can be a few notes on the back of a napkin or an A4 document um, that you put together. And this will allow you to um, really uh, clarify and formalize your ideas. And um, a great thing about this planning process is it'll help you to share your ideas with uh, your school community. Um, for example, it's a great time when you're in the planning phase to get your principal on board, um, any teachers that you might want to um, involve, your PNC, um, or any external um, stakeholders that might need to be brought on board as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, so the key things to include in um, writing up your project plan would be, um, first would be your project date. So this is a timeline or time frame of when you're looking to have the project. Um, so uh, this will include your, the planning of your project, um, when you're planning to start and finish your fundraising, um, and any time you might need to actually um, for example, if you're building something to do that. So an example would be if you're looking to build a playground in your school, you might spend two or three months planning that, getting some quotes from suppliers, um, and then you will move into your um, fundraising phase when you know how much you need to, uh, to 
raise. Um, you might spend six months or three to six months fundraising. Um, and then you might need a, a bit of time to actually build the playground um, and then celebrate the opening of the playground, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so the start and finish dates for your project versus mm -hmm. the fundraising campaign could be quite different. Yes, the exactly. fundraising campaign is going to be a small element of your greater project. Yes. yes. Um, good time here to write down who your project will be benefiting. Um, so uh, most projects will be benefiting students, but it might ex expand outside of that. So it could be your teachers as well or the community in general. So um, maybe for a sensory garden, you might be inviting the, mm. the community in as well. Um, good to note here who you'll be helping. And then your project description um, is really about what you're raising the money for and how you're going to do it. Um, what's it going to cost? So um, this is a, a, a budget um, basically of what um, you'll need to be spending funds on. Um, and it's good to note here if you have any existing funds available to your school, mm. um, uh, you might um, uh, I might want to talk about the um, a, a playground again. Mm. Um, so, for example, if you're wanting to raise uh, twenty thousand um, dollars for a playground, um, you might be planning to uh, apply for a ten thousand dollar grant. Um, you might know that your school can already bring in five thousand dollars with your traditional fundraising. So, for example, the PNC, that kind of thing, um, and then use the fundraise yourself platform um, that we'll be talking about a bit further on um, to raise that last five thousand. So. Um, the, the, what we can offer to you is um, a part of the bigger picture. Yeah, and it's a good idea to kind of break it down into chunks because sometimes it makes it feel a little bit more accessible. Mm. If you've got a really big target, um, just, you know, keeping that target as a whole can be quite daunting. Yeah. But if you kind of break it down and think, right, we're going to try and get this much through this avenue and this much through this avenue and the school's contributing a certain amount and, you know, the PNC needs to fundraise this much mm. um, and they're going to do it in these few different ways, um, it's, it's kind of a good way to, to break it down and make it feel a bit... Uh, a bit easier to achieve. Exactly. And then um, the final part to bring in here would be who your key team members are. So is it your principal? Um, is it your PNC, your teachers? Um, you can even look at um, tapping into your alumni network if you have one available to you, just depends on the project. And then again, any external suppliers that you might need to bring on board. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to answer the question that's come there from Deanne. Thanks so much for asking that about the Ixia value, just to go back to that. Um, Deanne asked whether the ICSIA value on the My School website, whether you should be looking at the average value or your schools. Take a look at your school's value. The average value is 1,000, and so that is that applies for everybody. And then um, schools that are below 1,000 are the ones that are eligible for support through us and that tax deductible donations. Mm -hmm. So telling your story, um, this is the way that you kind of start bringing that information together from your project plan. So uh, you would, you know, start with, and, and this is, sorry, I should say this is kind of your elevator pitch now. You're starting to develop that. So you've worked out all of those pieces of your project plan. Um, they're written down somewhere on a piece of paper, on a document in a, in a computer, and you've shared that with your team. And now you're starting to develop your story that you're going to start using as your appeal to your community. So, you know, we've used the example here of a library upgrade. What do you want to do? Well, we want to upgrade the library for our students as it's currently underused and unapp unappealing. The students just start using that and obviously as a result, perhaps their uh, engagement in literacy, reading, that sort of thing is, is low. Why is that important for that reason? That 150 students need a better space to read and learn. There are a lot of schools that want to introduce new um, um, chairs, new uh, furniture to introduce more flexible learning spaces these days. That's something that we quite commonly see schools wanting to fundraise for to make those spaces more engaging and better for um, a more modern learning style. And what will the outcomes be for your students? Well, what they're going to do is transform that space into great new reading areas, into those sorts of flexible learning spaces where the kids are going to be able to access new technology and equipment and uh, learn in more exciting and perhaps collaborative ways. And students are going to feel welcomed and have an exciting space in which to learn. So you can see that you know, we've taken those separate bits there and kind of pulled it all together into, into a story that you can tell. 
Uh, sometimes as well, when you're um, applying for funds, some funders are actually going to want even more information mm. about your project. Um, and you'll see when you get to our resources, um, if, you, if you go into our site, that there's a kind of simple project plan and then something that's a, a bit more um, complex as well. So particularly grant makers will want to know things like these questions. What exactly are the planned activities? Um, in the case of a STEM project, as, as one of you is um, fundraising for, and as we often hear about, um, that might involve not just purchasing a whole bunch of iPads and robots and, and coding software, but it might involve some teacher professional development as well. Quite often um, the teachers need some professional learning so that they can use those um, use that equipment really well in classrooms. Um, it might involve bringing parents in, perhaps there are parent volunteers who come in and uh, are able to run robotics activities with students as well. So, you know, there's usually a range of activities that are associated with a project and you'll be able to step them out in your application. Um, grant makers and perhaps other donors are going to really care about what the outcomes are as well. They want to know what difference their funds are going to make to your project. So up front, have a think about what those outcomes are that you expect. You know, how many more students might use the library or borrow books um, as a result of the upgrade? Um, you know, how many more teachers are going to be able to um, use robots in their classroom as a result of the training that they might undertake? Um, or how many more students can go on an excursion or a camp through that funding? So, you know, and, and then what are those outcomes from that that, the, that they might get as a result of that? So um, think about the different um, outcomes that you can articulate in, in your uh, application as well. And then think about how you'll be able to measure them too, because um, quite often we see um, the reports back that are expected from projects, and, and we expect this sort of information as well that explain how you're going to measure that. Um, and if you think about that right at the start, then it also means that you're able to uh, get the baseline data right at the start as well. So you can see how much you've achieved as a result of your project. Uh, oh, moving on, Oops. sorry, sorry. Here we go. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. So now we're going to move into finding funds. So one of the um, first questions that schools come to us and ask is, who do we ask for money? Who can help us? Um, who will donate to our project? Um, so this, in this part, we'll be talking about um, who you can look at um, for funds and then how to approach them. Okay, so this is um, your school community, the first people that you might think of when you start putting together your plan. Um, so your families, your teachers, PNC and students. Um, we don't recommend um, targeting this group of people for donations specifically. Um, you can say that donations are optional because they could be um, you know, financially exhausted. If you're in a, a disadvantaged area, they might not be able to, but these are going to be your champions and people that can spread your message far and wide. So um, the more people that know about the project, um, the, the more um, a chance of um, getting donations in. Um, and these people are really gonna be able to provide you with connections to and the next um, group of people. Absolutely, um, and we've heard really fantastic mm. stories about that actually, where um, families and teachers have spread that word out. They haven't necessarily been able to contribute themselves for whatever reason, um, but they have been able to spread that word out. And we found that um, when we when we ring a donor, we ask, what was your connection? And, and you know, they're um, a friend of a teacher or a business where um, one of the family members might work or something like that. So that that's kind of where those that next ripple effect comes in, that next circle. And you can see a whole range of examples of um, people and organisations that fall into that circle. Friends and colleagues, sporting groups, your um, students and many of your families will be members of sporting groups and religious groups who may be able to um, support the school in some way. School suppliers are another one. I mean, you think about the um, stationery suppliers, toilet paper suppliers, the people who supply the canteen, um, there may be many suppliers who work with your school and have a connection with your school who might be willing to support you as well. 
if you haven't already um, got a good relationship with your local council mm -hmm. or your state or federal MP, uh, it might be a good idea to knock on their door and, uh, and uh, start a bit of a conversation going there. Mm -hmm. And again, this comes from the experience of some schools who have let us know that um, they've either been able to get grants themselves um, some local MPs have donated to their schools as well from their electorate al allowance, for instance. Mm. Um, and, and other schools have told us that um, even if they haven't received financial support from their local MP, uh, they have helped enormously by connecting them in with grants that are available or mm. co potentially connecting them in with other donors as well. So they might be a good, um, a good new relationship to strike up as well. Yeah. And um, on um, that as well, this on this circle, um, your local businesses in the area mm. could be a great um, time to connect in with them. So um, if they've already given to your school, perhaps um, a, a, in a maybe a prize capacity for a raffle or something like that, you can approach them now and um, with um, if you're looking to fundraise with Schools Plus, you'll have the tax deductibility status um, and they might like to give financially. So particularly now at the end of financial year, it's yeah. a nice incentive. Um, so in the next couple of slides, I'll be focusing in a bit more on end of financial year, but it's good to keep in mind. Um, and you can also um, write up a media release and tell um, the local media about um, the project that you're working on. These are feel good stories that the newspapers like to pick up at times. And um, we do actually have a template there in our resources um, toolkit that you can, um, you can jump on and plug in your information. Great. And then the third circle, as your ripples get further away, is that kind of extended network. So um, here you're looking at um, larger businesses. And I guess we um, quite, we would like you to really think about um, tailoring your approach to businesses as well. Mm -hmm. um, an example might be um, looking at that STEM, STEM and robotics project. You know, the sort of businesses that you might go to for that might be um, technology-based businesses who you think are going to feel really connected to a project that's going to build children's STEM skills. Whereas if your project is more around health and fitness or the, um, um, you know, something around healthy living or nutritious eating, uh, it might be the local gym that you might go to or the local health mm. food store as the first port of call. So have a think about who in your community might feel most connected to um, the project and the aims of, of what you're trying to do. Um, similarly with not-for-profit organisations, you know, do that same kind of test there as well and think about what organisations are going to be the best fit. Mm. Um, you're going to have more luck, I think, if you, uh, if you kind of approach things in that way. Um, education department, um, you know, there, there are certain grants, for instance, that the education department provides um, federal and at federal and state levels. So you'll already probably be aware of what's available there. Um, business chambers, we talked about business, but um, often communities will have a business chamber with a big long list of all the businesses that are members of that business chamber. So that is um, a way to um, identify local businesses. And community groups too. Um, uh, are, is there a Rotary Club, a Lions Club, a Zonta Club, that kind of thing in your community? And if there is, is you know, are any of your family's members? Or if you want to just make a pitch to them, so absolutely go right ahead and do so. Be prepared in this case and, and also in other cases quite often to, to make presentations to them. It might be that they invite you to a meeting and uh, ask you to come along and speak about your project. Um, and um, with your project plan in place, with your pitch in place, you'll be well prepared to do that. Yeah, and on the community groups, if you are um, welcome to speak at one of their events, perhaps take some students along. That's a really nice visual and tangible um, outcome for their funds. Um, and perhaps you could tap into, if you've got an, an engaged alumni network, um, which is your ex-students, um, you might like to tap into them or your past teachers. If this is something that's interesting to you, we do have an alumni program um, that we have up and running at the moment, which is looking at a, a bit into alumni fundraising. Um, so feel free to reach out. We'll put up some contact details at the end um, and we can tell you a bit more about the alumni program. Um, and uh, there's also the potential to reach out to universities. Um, for example, uh, there's 
if you're looking at um, a science project, one of the your local university might um, be interested in funding um, a science program or something like that. You just yeah, you just need to basically be in it to win it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So there's a number of ways that you can reach out to uh, these potential donors and we've listed a whole bunch of them there. Things like including a notice in your newsletters, announcing it at your assembly, sharing it on social media and through LinkedIn. Um, and of course, um, if you have a, a project on our website uh, to which people can donate, um, you should always share that link, share it in your newsletter, put it on your website with a donate button to link through to it, um, email it out to people and make sure that that is what's shared so that it's a really easy step then for people to um, be able to make the donation. We've talked about presenting to community groups or businesses being prepared to do that. And my favourite one on this page is that last one about <laughs> um, sending a handwritten card. Um, uh, that can be a really nice touch and it's really yeah. rare. How often do you get something handwritten that lands on your desk? So that could make you really stand out from the crowd or potentially a note from one of the students, a handwritten, that could be really powerful. Um, and just a note on your social media, um, we do encourage you to be communicating more than once about your mm. project. It's really about repetition and people need to be exposed to your message quite a few times before they donate. Um, and we found um, in a bit of research that people are more generous throughout the week, in particular on Thursdays, um, and not so much on the weekend. So try and um, be sharing during that time as well. Mm, I'd love to know what's behind that. <laughs> I wonder why. Everyone's too relaxed on the weekends, yeah. maybe. <laughs> okay, so this is um, the end of financial year focus that we'll be doing for this webinar because we are coming up nice and close. Um, so with the tax deductible status that you get um, when you sign up to the Fundraise Yourself platform, um, it's a great incentive for businesses and um, for community members um, to be donating. Um, so this is a nice example post of one of um, our current fundraising schools, Fountain Gate. Um, so we gave them a template to use. They've popped it up on their website, uh, sorry, on their Facebook page, and overnight they got a $500 donation. So um, it's really just about, you know, popping your message out there and creating the awareness because lots of people don't know that when you're with School Plus, you get that tax deductibility. So um, for a little framing of how you would um, pop up your messaging would be at the beginning of June or maybe at the end of May, um, be creating awareness of that tax deductible status that you get um, when you're donating um, to your school. Follow up in mid-June um, with some emails um, and um, uh, letting people know um, where they can donate. Um, and then by the end of, the, of June, you're doing another social media push, um, you're creating some urgency. And then if anybody has come back with a little bit of interest, um, give them a call if you've got yeah. their number. Um, it's great to have somebody on the phone because you can communicate your passion for the project and they can really connect with you. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll get some of those um, donations in. That's a really good point about following up emails mm -hmm. and, um, and calls as well, making those calls. Um, because we do find, I mean, fundraising isn't easy and it's not a case of just kind of, you know, putting up a, a fundraising campaign or um, publishing a, a project on our website and then the money pours in. It does take a bit of work and that's where the project plan kind of comes into place and that plan about finding your funds. Um, you know, having perhaps individual members of your PNC having assigned, you know, different um, different approaches. You know, someone's responsible for going out to the local businesses. Someone else is responsible for building that relationship with the MPs and councils. You know, mm. someone else is responsible for another avenue. Um, because it, it does take some consistent effort to get the momentum going. And it's fantastic to kind of celebrate those successes as you go. So um, you can see here that, you know, even in the month of June, there's, you know, three or four steps that you might want to take mm. to, to keep the, the, the donations rolling in. Yeah, just it's just about reminding people. People are busy. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to start talking about grants in a sec as well. Mm. So um, anybody who's had an experience with grants, it would be really terrific to hear about that. And uh, anybody who um, wants to talk about any of those other ideas about way avenues of, of finding funds, people to approach and that sort of thing, it'd be great to hear your experiences too. I can see that there's a few. Mm -hmm. um, 
questions coming in and if you don't mind, I'm gonna look at them right now. So again, Deanne's asking, our school has a library fund that has a tax deductible status, but our other ABN number does not. Is this common across all schools? Yeah, so, so um, many schools do have library funds or building funds. Actually, it's probably an exaggeration to say many schools. Some schools have a building or library fund. And obviously that is uh, a fund to which people can give and that is tax deductible. Um, I think when studies were done into how many schools did this, in, in, in the less advantaged communities um, where those ICSIA values are below 1,000, it's in the single percent of schools that actually have those uh, building or library mm -hmm. funds. And that's one of the reasons that we were established. They take, they're quite tricky to set up, I think. Um, you know, that you need some, you know, legal and tax advice to be able to do so. And so many schools don't even have that. Um, through Schools Plus, um, what you're able to do is fundraise for buildings, for libraries, but also for a whole range of other projects um, that are needed. It doesn't have to be for, you know, um, infrastructure. It, uh, you know, even for playgrounds or shade cloth or those sorts of things, it can be for learning projects that are being done in your school as well. Um, great to hear about some success in, uh, in some grants as well. That's fantastic. Mm. Um, so he heading into grant writing. Um, so grants are a good way for schools to raise funds. Uh, they're a bit daunting, I've got to say. It's, mm. um, it, it can be, um, you know, a bit scary to kind of head into the world of writing applications for grants. And, and you know, the success rate as well, um, you do, you know, you don't, you don't find yourself successful with every grant that you write, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and again, I guess what you need to do, therefore, is really research the grant maker. I think that's a number one tip is um, research the grant maker to make sure right from the start that you're pretty confident that what you are applying for fits well within what their criteria and their interests are. The places where you can find that information are um, on their website. Um, uh, take a look, you know, there will be some guidelines there that you should definitely read first because that will set out the sorts of criteria that they have. Um, um, someone has gone to the trouble of writing them to explain what they're looking for, what they're, what sort of um, projects they're looking to fund, what sort of organisations they're looking to fund. So mm. please do that research um, because otherwise it's a terrible waste of time for mm. you and, and for the person who has to, who's reading the application at the other end. And you really want to improve your success rate, your hit rate by um, aligning yourself with the right organisations. Mm -hmm. um, making sure you're eligible by reading those guidelines um, eligibility for us, for instance, is around that ICSIA value, uh, but for other organisations it might be around location um, or it might be around theme of project. There might be some criteria around the amount of money that you can apply for. So mm -hmm. take a look at all of that information first to make sure that, um, that you're a good fit. Yeah, and just to jump in here, if you do come across a, a grant that requires DGR status um, or for your, your organisation um, to have that, um, a, like a charitable status, um, and um, your school doesn't have that, we actually provide a service, um, which is our grant service, that we can apply on your behalf. Yep. Um, so we have had a bit of luck um, doing that. So schools come to us, um, they give us as much notice as possible so we can um, review the grant um, and then submit it on their behalf. Um, so yeah, if you come across a, a, a grant, um, just let us know and we can help you out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I should have mentioned about the deductible gift recipient mm. status. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when you're writing as well, when it comes to writing about that um, the project that you're raising funds for, you're going to be able to refer back to that project plan that you did right at the start. That's where you're going to get that information from. And when you put it into the application form, there's going to be some word counts and you're going to need to be quite concise there. I mean, quite often the word counts are, you know, only two or 300 words. And sometimes I filled in grants that only are counted in characters. You can only kind of fit 50 mm. words into an answer. Um, so you need to be able to get your across your message really sharply, um, really clearly. You should really avoid any acronyms. Mm. Um, you know, the, uh, the 
the uh, you, the school might be really familiar with the GTPS at the school, but that doesn't mean that the um, grant reader, the person who's reading your application, is going to be. So make sure you're writing in um, simple language. Um, avoiding kind of education speak. I can see that Shez here has says that she tries to write them through the eyes of the students and maintain mm -hmm. your excitement. And I think that's really good advice there I think that as well. Could be really powerful um, and really connect the, the grant maker with your with your project. So yeah, well done. Yeah, Thanks, yeah, yeah good, advice. Awesome. good advice. Good <laughs> advice. Um, and I think that goes to that point of being quite compelling as well. Mm. So you, you are trying to be evocative um, in your grant writing. Um, even though you've got quite limited words, you are trying to tell a fantastic story about how the donation that you're seeking is going to change the lives of students in your school. Mm. And the specific bit there relates to perhaps around numbers, how many students it's going to impact. Um, what exactly the impact is going to be, you know, rather than just talking about things in general terms, where you can be quite specific. Mm -hmm. That comes to the budget as well. The budget should be specific too. It's not much good just writing, um, we, we're going to buy equipment for $10,000. Um, generally, someone who's giving you a grant will want to know what sort of equipment that's going to be. Does that mean 10 iPads? Does that mean seats? For the outdoor learning area and plants and you know landscaping um, you know to talk about what exactly mm. that is yeah. um, and make sure that um, the budget connects with the story that you've told throughout the application as well we've seen some applications where um, you know they're all about um, um, a kitchen garden for instance um, and you know they're going to be learning about nutritious eating and um, plants and that sort of thing and then something random is thrown into there like um, um, like fitness equipment or yeah. a bicycle or something yeah that's completely off and, and that can be a little bit off-putting for people that are wanting to fund you so yeah just keep it all in line and if you do mention something in the budget pop it in um, the body of your the grant. Yeah, make sure it makes sense. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it goes without saying, but make sure you submit the application on time. Check those guidelines at the start so you know exactly when it's due. Don't forget to check if there are um, time differences as well so that you don't get tripped up by that. Uh, because often there's a really hard closing time and um, most um, organisations won't accept late applications. No. Um, give yourself enough time to, in case there's any technical hurdles or anything as well. And actually one tip that's not here, but um, sometimes it's really useful to write your application on a Word document yeah. Yeah. rather than write it straight into the portal, mm. wherever it is, um, so that if something goes wrong, you've, you've got a master copy of it as well. And you can spell check quite easily on a Word document. <laughs> yeah, maybe not so much on the, on the website. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've just popped together some places that we've um, been able to find grants in the past and perhaps you might be interested in looking at them. Um, there's a few that are free. So uh, Tender Bridge, it's um, focused specifically for schools. Um, that's free to join. Um, and then Grant Guru, um, that's free for a basic membership. Um, if you're looking to maybe up your grant game and um, perhaps pay for something, we use um, the Grants Hub, which is great, but it's a little bit on the pricier side. So it's 29 a month. Um, however, there is a free trial mm -hmm. of 14 days. So perhaps that's all you need. You might want to jump on there for the free trial, have a look at all the grants, write down who the funders are, and then um, you can submit directly through the website. Mm -hmm. You might not need to pay. And then the same um, for the funding centre. So it's 125 a year, but they also have a 14 day free trial. Yeah, and um, my children are at school and um, I'm on the PNC at my school. And we did um, take out a subscription to the funding centre a number of years ago. And I've got to say, it was, it was quite useful at the time to find a range of grants that um, mm. didn't come onto our radar, radar any other way. So um, it might be worth even, you know, taking out a subscription for one year if your PNC is able to afford it or your school's yeah. able to afford it to um, get a list of grants that you might not otherwise know about. But Tenderbridge as a free service is also um, really useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the... One of the last things that you need to do, but most important things is saying thank you to donors. So once you've had all that success with all those new donors that you've been able to find um, through your excellent project plan and, uh, and your great fundraising campaign, 
um, you definitely need to go back to those donors and, uh, and express your gratitude. So there's a whole range of ways that you can do that and we've run through a few of them here. Um, uh, you know, something really personal, quotes from parents, quotes from students, photos, videos, um, sending thank you cards. We, we've heard from donors who've been moved to tears as a result of um, a thank you card with, with students yeah, writing in it. Definitely. And I think it's good to um, highlight here the value of your photos and your videos, especially of your students and the way that it's helped your school. So the, the photos and the videos, they're really powerful to connect them. And one of the reasons that you do want to be thanking your donors is that it can um, maintain the, a relationship with that donor and they can potentially give for um, future fundraising projects, keep them engaged with the school um, and also keep them updated um, uh, with um, your reports um, that you might be preparing for yeah. grant makers yeah. or any um, reporting that you're doing on the project. It's great to keep um, yeah, your donors updated there. Yeah, I mean, another example that we've had recently actually has been a school that um, has had a connection for a few years with a former student, mm. a former student who's who's older now um, and, and went to the school some decades ago and he's reconnected with the school and he's been giving them um, some money over the last few years and they've been keeping him up to date with just an email every now and then, a few photos, uh, here's how we're going. And um, Amazingly, just a few months ago, he got invited to the school for a morning tea and the principal had invited him along to, um, you know, offer him a cup of coffee and a few biscuits and show him around and, and meet the people who he'd been helping. And at that uh, morning tea, he told the principal that he would like to donate more than $100,000 to the school, um, which is just an incredible story. And I don't know that everybody has a donor of that magnitude and generosity in their community. Um, but um, it, I, I guess it goes to show that fairly simple ways of keeping in touch and um, keeping donors up to date mm -hmm. can have pretty amazing outcomes. Yeah. Um, can I just say before we move on as well, Shez, I think it was Shez who had asked earlier about joining Philanthropy Australia. Um, we're members of Philanthropy Australia. I, I don't know how useful it would be for a school to be a member of Philanthropy Australia. And I guess what made me think of that was the previous slide that had those mm. different grants, um, grant um, um, kind of advisory services in it. I, I wonder whether that might be where you might find the most use mm. there. Yeah. Okay, so moving on. Um, so I guess the key takeaway from this section is um, don't be afraid um, to ask for money or ask uh, or apply for grants. Um, it can be a little bit daunting and one of the most common fears about fundraising is actually asking for money. Um, but remember, you're not asking for money for yourself. Yeah. You're asking for the students that are in your school. You're asking for your teachers. You're asking for your school community. Um, and in the world of fundraising, we have a ratio that we normally work work on so um, which is uh, you'll go out to eight people um, let them know about um, the project that you're working on fundraising for you might get interest from four people and then you might get a, a, a donation from one so um, you might get seven no's um, but I remember that a no doesn't necessarily mean um, no forever. It might just mean no for the time being. Um, they might really love the project that you're working on but might not be able to give it this time um, but and yet keep people updated, let them know, um, let them know that it's okay that they can't donate at yeah. this time um, and um, keep the relationship going and they might donate in the future. Yeah, it might also be that the project's not the right fit for yeah. them, you know, the time might be not, not be right or the project might not be right and just um, opening the door and mm -hmm. uh, keeping, keeping it open um, might lead to donations down the track if not immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to jump over to the Fundraise Yourself platform. Um, so again, I'm going to, so just quickly on the Fundraise Yourself platform, it was um, designed with schools in mind. Um, and uh, it's your own online fundraising space. Um, you'll get your own unique URL when you sign up. Um, so I'm going to navigate now to our Schools Plus website um, to show you how to register um, and then how to create a project. While Melissa's doing that, I'm going to talk about Lynette's point there, which is really true about um, uh, failed grants. 
Um, if you do miss out on a grant, it's a great idea to go back to the organisation and ask for some feedback. Mm. Not everyone is able to give that and that might be uh, because they've just received so many applications they can't have the time to give that individual feedback. Mm. But where they do, it can be really valuable and allow you to tailor your next one or improve your next one. Yeah, definitely. Um, so everybody should be able to see the Schools Plus website. If you can't, just let me know. Um, and you'll be able to see when you hover over the Schools tab, a whole range of services that we offer to our schools. Um, after the webinar, if you want to explore that, um, that'd be a good idea. Um, however, the, the Fundraise Yourself and the Alumni Program with the two of the areas that we've been speaking about today. Um, so to register your school, jump over to the login register section. Um, we've got a test school that we um, can log in as well, but we'll go in um, and register. Okay. Um, so once you're on the registration page, you'll see um, some guidelines come up. Um, have a read of those. Um, and there's also some key things to keep in mind before you register, which is you'll need to have your school logo handy in a JPEG, um, your principal's email address and phone number. Um, when you're registering for school, uh, your school for the platform, they um, will receive an email. Um, they'll need to be aware that this is happening. Um, your details um, as the secondary or the main point of contact um, for the school. And then your school banking details if you're a school uh, not within New South Wales. That's right. We're, we're well aware that in New South Wales, schools are on a central banking system and we uh, work with that uh, with a, that unit quite often. Mm. Um, and there's a special spot on the uh, form where you can tick that you're one of those schools. Yeah. So have a read through um, the notes that you'll need to look at. So we'll just go through those quickly. Um, hit next. Um, so when you're um, in this section, um, all schools that are under a thousand at Ixia have been loaded into our system. Um, so you'll just start typing your school name and it'll come up. We've got a test school that we use um, for our webinars. Um, so we'll just pop that in so we can show you what that looks like. Yeah. Wearing away. <laughs> and then hitting next. Okay, so as I mentioned before, this is where you upload the logo, um, contact details of your principal, um, your contact details, banking details, then you'll hit submit. Um, once you've hit submit, you'll be taken to our school's dashboard, or your school's dashboard, um, and I'm going to jump over to something I prepared earlier. So uh, you should be seeing now um, your, the Australian Schools Plus dashboard. Um, when it's your school, it'll have your school logo and your school name here. Um, you can see information of your account, um, any projects you've created, budgets and resources. So I'll just jump into the resources tab. We have talked about this a little bit through the webinar. Um, so in this resources tab, you'll find um, your project plans here. Um, some information on grant writing, um, then some templates, so in particular the tax time. Mm -hmm. um, we do have, I'm not sure if I mentioned that, but we do have a tax time email um, that we've got on the resources and we do have some social media templates as well, which um, we can email out to you and the media release as well. So um, jumping back into the dashboard, um, when you're ready to create a project, um, you've done all your planning, um, you'll come over here and click create project. Okay, so um, this is the area where you'll um, pop in all of that planning that you've done mm. um, before. Um, we suggest as well with um, with the platform that you um, plan it all in a Word document before and then add it in. It's just a little bit easier. Um, adding in contact details, um, the information um, on planning. A bit of information that we need there around um, type of project, what you're aiming to do, those fundraising and project dates that we had before. Yeah. And the, and the details of the project too. Mm, and this is where it's good to differentiate between the dates that you'll be working. So you'll be popping in when um, your project 
um, the whole project is going to be um, running and then this will be your fundraising. So this will um, tell the website when to launch your fundraising, online fundraising campaign yeah. and when to close it. Yeah. Um, so you'll pop in. Can I say something here as well? So um, when you're thinking about what project you might fundraise for on the website, um, you know, we do suggest that you make it a, a kind of achievable target as well. Mm. Um, we've had some schools that have had really high targets and I, I think that um, on any crowdfunding platform, you know, those, those um, campaigns that get mega hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars are very, very rare. Mm. Uh, so, you know, a, a few thousand dollars, up to $10,000, we would suggest, unless you're very confident that you've got some donors out there who um, you know are ready to donate, um, we suggest something, you know, kind of under $10,000 mm -hmm. as a starting point, I think. Yeah. Um, it might be then that, um, you know, if you do find success on that quite quickly, that you could um, launch a second campaign, a, a slightly different part of your project. Um, but, you know, setting yourself a really high target, as we said, fundraising, it does take kind of consistent yeah. effort and you kind of want to hit it and blitz it mm. over, a, over a defined period of time. So having a, a achievable target is important. Yeah the, yeah, the achievable is really important and also your time frame because it creates a sense of urgency if mm. donors feel as though their donation right now is going to significantly help um, the school, then they're a lot more likely to donate mm -hmm. rather than something that's a lot more open-ended. Um, so just jumping back to the website, um, this will be a chance to upload photos. We recommend um, having your images as um, images with people, um, images with students, um, showing um, an example um, of how the funds are going to help. Um, and if you do have video, um, you don't need to be a photographer or a videographer. We, we've got amazing technology. You can just film a video on your iPhone and edit it a little bit in iMovie or even get one of your students to do some editing if you're in a high school or even a primary school. Kids are amazing. Um, and then down here, um, we do often get questions about donation levels. Mm. Um, so these are about making... Um, the donation quite tangible to your donor. Um, so for example, we've got the facility to have four donation levels. Um, you might like to start a donation level at 50. Um, for example, if you're working on a STEM project, this could um, uh, purchase uh, one robot. Yeah, one robot um, versus, you know, versus an iPad or a laptop or something like yeah, that. Or so like a virtual reality headset. You can break that down and um, yeah, make it nice and achievable yeah might nice and clear to your donor I think and then they're kind of suggestions about how much the donors should um, donate and I think there's plenty of um, psychological and you know behavior yeah. psychology <laughs> that suggests that um, that that's a good way to go when it comes to fundraising yeah. as yeah. well yeah definitely um, and then space again for your budget um, and then making note here of um, an acquittal, which will be your reporting at the end of a project. Um, so once you're all ready to go, um, hit submit and then it will come to us yeah. um, and we will um, help you before we're publishing. Um, but once that's all published, here's something that I prepared earlier which is, or one of our schools has prepared earlier, which is Chifley Public School. Um, this is the profile that they have up at the moment and the profile that will be similar to what your school will have. Um, this is your very own fundraising space. You'll see that your goal is nice and clearly here. Um, the amount of donors, your dollar, hand, uh, dollar levels are down the side here. Um, your project description and um, a great photo there. Um, one thing that this reminds me to point out is that it's free, as we've already said, mm. for schools and PNCs to use our website. There's no cost to you. Um, but when uh, donors do donate to your project through this website, um, we do retain 5% of those donations. And mm. that's made clear in our donation form that they'll come across as they make that donation. Um, and that's to um, support our work with you and support this um, fundraising platform as well. Mm -hmm. 
And this is a good example. You can see down the right hand side, those donation levels there as well. Yeah, so $20 um, will purchase a mouse um, and then they've, they're increasing the value all the way up to um, a laptop with accessories. Um, so just to wrap up the Fundraise Yourself platform, to get started, um, you register um, your school um, at schoolsplus.org.au. Um, then you can go about creating your project, register, um, submit your draft, um, and we'll help you um, have a live project. And then start spreading the word. Um, as we've said before, the more people you, that know about your um, project, the better. So that you are. URL is really nice and shareable and um, yeah, easy for you to let people know. Yeah, um, I'm just going to address that question there as well. No, Schools Plus is a not-for-profit. We're a, cha a charity um, with deductible gift recipient status. So no, we're not a, a private enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are a charity. Um, but like many charities, um, there is a small proportion of each donation that is retained for our costs to help provide the services that we provide. Yeah. Um, we're almost at the point of wrapping up here, so I would love to see if there are any more questions uh, that we can help with or um, anything else that we, you know, that you might find that we haven't addressed. Mm. Um, there's another question there, if your ICSIA is 1037, you're not eligible, I'm really sorry about that. Um, no, we do have that cutoff of, of below 1,000. Um, um, and I know that you may well have some students in your community who are less advantaged, but unfortunately, um, um, that's that's part of our, uh, our arrangement for that, that, that cutoff there. Yeah, but the information in this webinar, it's um, free for you to use. You can, yeah. um, we've had schools that they might not have used the platform, but they've gone off and done amazing things with fundraising. Yeah, absolutely. We hope that you can take any of the tips mm. that we've been able to give you today and, uh, and use them for the benefit of your students, for sure. Yeah. Uh, the library fund, yeah, uh, so um, you'd have to check with, there's probably some documentation around your particular library fund there. The question is um, um, what can library funds with DGR status um, fundraise for? Um, look, I'm, I'm probably not the best qualified person to answer that question, but yes, of course it is uh, for books and for your library generally. I know some schools um, have um, kind of expanded the, the what's, what, what a library fund can fundraise for to things like some STEM equipment that's used in the library, um, computers used in the library, that sort of thing these days, because obviously libraries aren't just full of books anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it may be for more than just books, but um, I think that's probably something you'd need to check at your school uh, about or mm. perhaps even the ATO would have to give advice about that. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to pop up our contact details. Feel free to ask any more questions that you might have. Um, so if you do want to get in touch with us, um, you can contact me. Um, this is my direct line um, and email address there. Um, and then feel free to subscribe to our newsletter, um, which has lots of information about what's going on at Schools Plus. Um, and then following us on um, uh, the social media that we have below. Um, and just a note, we will be sent uh, this webinar is being recorded so we'll send you a recording um, at the end we'll also send you a short survey so if you don't mind especially because this is my first one i'd love any feedback <laughs> that you might have <laughs> she's done a great job <laughs> yeah um so before we wrap up was there any last minute questions thanks everybody for joining us we'll be here for another minute or so so if you do have any last minute questions do let us know um, or get in contact with us um, in these ways um, really appreciate you spending your thursday afternoon with us um, yeah. and have a great long weekend ahead for all of you who have one yes great thank you thank you very much <laughs>